This is Jake Lawrence, and you're listening to the Jake Lawrence Podcast, a weekly online radio show dedicated to Chicago industry, technology, and thought leadership. Today's guest is Bill Walwyn, who is a cloud and risk mitigation expert. And if you have no idea what any of those words mean, you're going to be in for a treat. It's all about technology today. It's all about thought leadership. And it's all about predictions for the future and perhaps a little about the robot apocalypse. All right. We are sponsored by Corporate Suites Network. Corporate Suites Network is Chicago's premier vendor for short-term rentals, furnished apartments, month-to-month apartment rentals, and corporate housing. You could visit them at csnhousing.com to speak to a very, very experienced staff. All right, listen up and try not to be afraid of the robots. Well, thank you so much for uh, being on the Jake Lawrence podcast, Bill. It is wonderful having you on. Well, thank you. I'm looking forward to it. Excellent. Uh, We connected through LinkedIn, and um, this is kind of how a lot of my guests have been popping up. Um, I'm finding really cool and interesting people on LinkedIn, and they have you know some unique things to say about their industry and in Chicago. And I brought you on because I kind of consider you a thought leader in the cloud and risk mitigation space. So, you know, I'm looking at your LinkedIn profile right now and the snippet that you have is cloud and risk mitigation expert. And I was wondering if you could just give us a kind of a top level highlight of what that means. Businesses are looking to adapt to cloud in many different fashions and they're just trying to understand how it applies to them and their business. Um, maybe they, they don't know how, uh, maybe they're just thinking of it as a, a tool to get away from managing their own hardware, but it's far more than that. Uh, if you utilize it correctly, it can become a business advantage, a competitive advantage, give you ability to be more agile, to absorb a uh, mergers and acquisition uh, far faster than you would in a normal environment. So there's, there's far more capability in cloud than just saying, okay, I'm going to, you know, uh, get out of managing my own hardware uh, and, and look to put my uh, applications into the cloud. It's, it gives you, that's the first step, but then the, the second step after that would be, okay, now what? And then, uh, you know, risk mitigation is a very strong passion of mine. Uh, IT security and cybersecurity are, are something that I'm very passionate about, um, not only in my business, day-to-day, my customers, but, it, you know, my hobbies, what I like to read and, and look into uh, in my pastime. It don't sound as enjoyable as uh, as maybe, uh, you know, uh, some people might think of, you know, who want to go play golf and, and that, but... Uh, you know, uh, I used to do those things, but I have two young, small children, so I like to, you know, spend my time with them. And when I'm not, I I'm find myself at home with some downtime. And uh, so, you know, those are the kinds of things uh, that I am into. <laughs> sure. Yeah. You know, I want to get into cloud and deploying, you know, cloud first types of strategies in your businesses and what it means to be asset focused. And I want to get into those, but I want to try to learn about your journey, about how you became this passionate about cloud technologies and risk mitigation. Sure, sure. I've been in the uh, the IT space in Chicago for quite some time now, you know, since the mid 90s when it was all the rage of the first cell phones and the largest cell phone networks coming online. That was some of the, the key technologies. And then you had the dot com boom and the shortly thereafter the bust. I studied uh, binary code in at DeVry, so I'm well aware of how computers work and communicate and talk. But the advances we've made in the last 20 years has been astronomical, specifically in the last five to 10. Prior to that, we you know we probably stayed stagnant for about 20 years, and it's amazing the the advancements that we have made as a, as a technological uh, advances and environment that we've put together. Uh, where that's taken us, right? That's kind of what led me into the passion that I am today. 
uh, just seeing all the advances that we've made really holds a what I would deem a you know five to ten year path for the future a very big excitement. Although you know if you read some of the prognosticators out there, a little scary that you might find yourself on the other side of the machines taking over like Terminator. But the advances in technology lend itself to people being scared that the machines are going to take over, right? Yeah, we will have plenty of time to talk about that. And that is definitely something that I want to bring up, especially what your predictions are for, you know, the changing face of cloud technology, even in the next five to 10 years. I am interested, though, in, in kind of hearing about the advancements you just said, going back five to 10 years. Can you give us a little bit more insights into that specifically, maybe in the five year? Well, part? sure. I mean, in my day to day business, right, and, and what I was have been doing I was primarily in a uh, space where we were developing solutions and creating solutions for customers um, to help their businesses with applications, with data center technologies. But specifically, you know, some of those advances have become into the chipsets and so the and servers per se, right? Uh, the Intel chips and the Intel microprocessors and the processors inside of uh, computers themselves and the invention of uh, solid state drives as far as storage and memory are concerned have taken the server platform and shrunk its platform astronomically. So those advances alone, the compute power in a, in a server or, or in a storage uh, area network have far exceeded where they thought they would be. You have more compute power in a, in a server today than you used to have in a massive mainframe that used to take up the, you know, the whole uh, floor of a, of a data center. That, you know, in one little, you know, one new server, there's more compute power, more storage capacity in that than used to be in the, the something the size of, of a semi truck. So, uh, and that's all based upon the developments in chipsets and, you know, Intel and Silicon Valley and, and where they've taken, you know, the leaps and bounds of uh, where technology has come in the last five or 10 years. You'll see it in everywhere from hyper-converged infrastructure and being able to have 2U to 4U box, the same capacity that you would have to have in a whole rack uh, five years ago. That's where it's taken us in that technology today, right? Yeah, yeah that's, that's where good. we've come in, in probably the last five years, if, at least what I've seen, right? You know, and, you know, being in the data center business and, and being in many data centers, many of customers' data centers, whether they be on their own premise or in a, in another, in a data center provider's uh, space, the footprint is just shrinking uh, astronomically, which lends itself to why the cloud has been so prolific, uh, because you can do so much more with so much, so much less. Yeah, I just wanted to shift gears for just a little bit. When I introduced you as a cloud expert and for the audience members that aren't IT literate and they're not tech savvy and probably a lot of what you just said is probably going over their heads right now. But maybe if we could just lay a ground center right now, a foundation, what is the cloud and what do you mean by having a data center? So let's start with the first one. What is the cloud? The cloud is, well, it can have 10 different definitions depending on who you ask, but the, the ultimate underlying 30,000 foot view to those that don't know technology is basically your applications, your software on somebody else's servers and somebody else's hardware. Rather than you owning the computer that's holding those applications, somebody else owns them and they're responsible for them. And all you're responsible for is your your business now, your day-to-day -day operations. Uh, you no longer have to worry about taking care of those systems, uh, power, cooling, making sure that you build out a specific room. A data center in traditional terms may have been in a customer's office, a secondary closet <laughs> that eventually they turn into a, their own data center because as they grow, as their business grows, they need to keep adding capacity, keep adding employees, they keep adding systems. They have a, a new a business model or a new widget they want to develop and those systems tend to grow. You have new applications that you bring in, um, whether it's something of inventory control or whether it's something to the nature of uh, customer relationship management. Those applications and we've seen those shift where you know now they become software as a service tools right 
even Microsoft shifted and moved to their Office 365 environment rather than you buying the software, owning the software, putting it on your own servers and your own computers in your closet, so to speak, to keep it high level. Those have now shifted all to the internet, so to speak, where Microsoft puts those assets in their data center. You brought up software as a service. I don't think many people, I don't think they understand what that sure. means either. You can maybe give a little definition of what SaaS is. Absolutely. It is, you know, rather than, again, you buying software. So in, the, in previous lives, uh, if you wanted a customer relationship tool, uh, you would buy it from, you know, a software, uh, something maybe, you know, from Microsoft, their Dynamics tool, or, you know, even Oracle has a customer relationship tool. And you would buy this software, you would, you know, you would have to build out a bunch of computer hardware that they're called servers in order to house all that, that software. And then you would have to, you know, start putting data in there relative to maybe, you know, what the customers have bought from you in the past, uh, what their history of orders are, what their invoicing uh, history is. It was a way for you to have the ability to talk to your customers more intelligently about what they had previously done. Now they've taken that software package and you usually have to do a lot of custom development, meaning if I wanted that system to talk to my invoicing system, to talk to my warehousing system, to talk to my inventory systems or other systems I had, I would have to do a lot of custom building of it. And as we have seen, uh, that custom work can cause issues for corporations as they grow or as they, they age. 20, 30 years down the road, that system has now become antiquated and you want to replace it. Well, you can't because it was all written in custom language and you can't just replace it because if you do that, you're going to break a lot of things and things aren't going to work the right way. And people are going to be screaming at the top of the ceilings because there's things don't work and I can't get my job done or I can't process an order. And, you know, so you find organizations that tend to leave things and just let it sit there and run. They don't want to break it. That's changed to the software as a service model, meaning now rather than doing all that custom work, the manufacturer of the software has done it for you. And all you have to worry about is the data that's actually in there. And it gives you far more ability to be to act on intelligence of that data. Now with analytics, that is such a big to do in the marketplace, I can take that data and I can make decisions on it. I can make growth decisions on it. I can predict, you know, uh, look at my uh, history of uh, revenue and growth, and then I can make business decisions on that data now. I can take that data and I can do things, special marketing um, campaigns with it, or I can do focused, targeted uh, marketing. So a lot more now, you have the capabilities of your folks in your organization shifting their skill sets rather than managing all the software and fixing all the broken pieces with their wrenches and, and typing your keyboards. Those folks now can be far more advantageous to the business and use tools that they could actually help the business make more intelligent decisions on. It gives them the capabilities to do that and takes all the day-to-day -day stuff off their plate. Yeah, that's a great explanation. I'm kind of reading off your LinkedIn page right now, and it says under the heading cloud, in the old days, business leaders largely considered cloud as a cost and efficiency tool, no longer. The best leaders I know see cloud as a way to exponentially improve their company's speed to market, business processes, business agility, and compelling customer experiences. I think right there is a great benefit for you know the cloud, and I think everything you've said so far is a great benefit. What are the challenges for businesses that are trying to integrate a cloud first type of strategy? Challenges are, you know, how do I get there? What does it mean to my business? I mean, if you, again, as I prefaced it earlier in our conversation, if you ask 10 different people what the definition of cloud is, you can get 10 different answers. Uh, you can also get 10 different potentially approaches to what a, a client or a business should do or look at to cloud. And not every environment is right for a particular company's business. So if I were advising a client and they're saying, well, we want to develop a cloud strategy first, my first inception of conversation would be, well, let's take a step back. Let's understand what you're trying to ultimately accomplish. If you're ultimately trying to accomplish just putting applications out of your data center into another data center, so you don't have to manage the underlying hardware anymore, that's a goal and, and that's plenty achievable and it's plenty simple enough and it's easy to do. 
But if you're looking for more agility as a business, well, what does that mean for your particular business? Maybe it's a, a go-to-market strategy around a particular new product you want to develop. You know, that could be. And, and the reason that helps is because if you develop a cloud strategy first, then now if I want to do R&D and I want to look at this new product that I want to develop, I don't have to go out and buy a bunch of systems and computers to start doing my initial footprint of R&D to determine if it's going to make my company money or not. I can put it, build a small little cloud environment, which is basically a small little computer that I'm sharing with a bunch of other people that I don't have to make a massive capital expense investment on. I can look at whether or not this is going to make my company money and do some R&D and research and development on it. And if it's something that we deem as a, a go-to-market strategy and it grows, then you can grow your cloud footprint as it grows, as the business needs it to grow. If it's something that, you know what, it's not going to make my company money, I can move away from it very easily without much loss of capital expenditure to do such. Yeah. Again, uh, some good benefits for sure. Uh, you said earlier though, that it frees up businesses to look at their analytics and to become more data-driven as their organizational culture in order to make, you know, more strategic decision-making. So the cloud kind of enables them, you know, in some instances to do that. Have you ran into any instances where companies and organizations have a hard time kind of making that organizational switch, that cultural shift to becoming more data-driven? You do. You run into, you know, organizations where you know, they'll say, we've done it this way for the last hundred years. This is what has allowed us to be successful and we're going to continue to do it this way. And, you know, at, at that point, you know, it's, it's my job to kind of educate them on where their competitors are going or where the competitive market is going. And they want to be more competitive. And if they want to have that customer experience, then they're going to need to think outside the box. And I put it this way, right? In the world that we're in now, everyone expects immediacy, including their customers, because they get it. The, the philosophy no longer can withstand that, well, wait a minute, the people I do business with don't get to me immediately. They don't know me. How do they not know me? Uh, because this is so immediate in everyone's personal life that the business life, you're like, well, wait a minute, you're a $100 million company. How come you can't do what my $10 uh, or my $800 iPhone can do? That makes no sense to me uh, why you can't market to me appropriately, right? I mean, we've all been there. We go to the store, we shop, and then we get an email with, you know, I get them all the time, right? Uh, I go and shop at a prime example. I'll give you, uh, I shop at Aldo. I buy some shoes there from time to time. And they have my email address and they're marketing to me on a regular basis, but they put no analytics behind it. And the reason is, is because they keep sending me emails with women's clothes. I'm not a woman. I don't buy that stuff. So I delete the email right away. If they would market to me correctly, I might see a new pair of shoes that I like that I'd actually go online and order. That's where you put analytics behind customer experience because the compelling customer experience means you're able to take the, that data now and actually make intelligent decisions on it. And that is relative towards pretty much every business because you're trying to gain more market share. You're trying to gain more revenue. You're trying to gain more wallet share within your clients. It's easier to gain more wallet share within your clients than it is to go out and find new ones. So how can I gain more wallet share if I'm not using the data I already have existing to market to them in a different way and make it focused and individualized? And it's all the data is there. But if I'm too busy putting fires out in my organization, meaning, oh, you know, Bob says he can't access the systems uh, or, you know, if you're too focused on those things, then you're never going to be able to get there. And I'll give you another example, right? Um, there's this manufacturing company one of my colleagues was working with. And I just know about it because I talk to a lot of my colleagues about what they're doing and what they see out in the marketplace. And it helps me from an educational standpoint. And he was working with them and, and you know, much what you asked, the challenges of going to the cloud and, and what organizations are faced with. Well, this organization was faced with a challenge if they stayed status quo. And the reason is, is because much as I said, they were putting out fires already. They're too busy managing their environment to use tools they already owned 
and get proper analytics about it so they can make intelligent decisions about machine learning in their own manufacturing process. So they had the machine learning capabilities. They had the analytics being collected. The problem is, is they could never act on it because they were too busy maintaining day-to-day -day operations. So their whole focus and reasoning behind why they wanted to make this shift and move was to be able to take those tools and finally be able to use them to make intelligent decisions through the machining process and have the machine learning aspects actually do something with that data. That's where you're still going to actually need the human interaction with machine learning and AI, as we're probably going to lend itself to, is you need someone to have that data and be actionable now upon that data and, and utilize our thought process to, to do problem solving and then put the intelligence into the machine then to say, okay, now that you've learned this, make these adjustments. Yeah. And I think you've already started to transition to this next question, but I think part of your day to day is convincing organizations about what the market competition is. So what is the market competition right now? It's everywhere. It's prolific. And I say that because if, you know, CEOs and business executives, they're, they're reading every day. If they're smart, and, and I presume that they are because they developed, a, you know, multi, you know, hundreds of million of dollar companies, but they read, you know, uh, magazines or, or articles around, you know, business making, uh, businesses making advances and moving forward. And I would envision that they would be thinking the same thing. How can my business do that? Right. Their board of directors should be made up of folks that are, you know, younger than them. And no offense, but they've seen it, right? The immediacy of the millennials and the immediacy of society has such that you're not going to be able to attract and retain top talent if you're not be willing to move the needle a little bit and to adapt to the changing times. Do they still use horse and buggy to get to work? No, they use a car and there's roads. And so times have adapted and I believe companies and organizations, uh, you know, need to adapt with them as well now. But still, they're scared. They're unsure of uh, what, you know, that shift means for them. And, you know, you'll have some organizations that if they can't see the little box that is in the corner, their stuff on it, they really don't understand. They want to hold on to that asset and rather than relinquish uh, the rights to it. I got a customer of mine who, it's a small little customer, but next week we're going to do a tour of uh, a data center. And the reason is, is because the president and the COO don't realize what they're spending money on. And he, and, you know, the IT department is constantly being asked to whether or not this is a viable spend. And they want to create a disaster recovery plan. And with that disaster recovery plan means more spend. And the business owners are asking themselves, well, what are we spending money on? Why can't we just put another air conditioner in the closet? And that's going to be our disaster recovery plan. And uh, the, the IT department's like, no, 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 you can't do that. And they're like, well, it's going to cost me, you know, $5,000 more a month. Where's that money going? So you really, you know, the tangible asset that some organizations are used to having their hands on it, right? When you go buy that new car, it's in your driveway. It's in your, you can see it, right? And you, you own it. Or when you buy your new house, you own it. So today's society of when I buy things, it's somewhere out, God knows where, in, in this cloud in the sky that I, I don't know where my money is, where we're going, right? What my assets are. So you have to put some tangibility behind it. And I think organizations then, if you take them slowly, they'll, they'll, they'll get it eventually because they see it everywhere and if they don't all the trends and if they re are reading business uh, harvard business review or the wall street journal it, they'll tell them that if they don't adapt they they will be out of business that you must uh, otherwise you know you're going to be left behind yeah a great answer and i kind of wanted to get into the the technology aspects of the next five to ten years but before we kind of venture into that you know, part of your job is to be a risk mitigation expert. And you wrote a plan late 2015. Is your 2016 cybersecurity plan ready? And uh, how that article has changed to today is developing a cybersecurity plan. Has it changed or is it the same thing or, you know, maybe touch on that a little well, bit? Well, it, it's partially same, similar, but things, you know, society's changed. The Internet of Things, machine learning, all of the pieces of consumer environment touching the Internet has exponentially exploded. So there are far more risk points now. 
and there are far more places that you need to watch as an organization. Uh, and it's no more just the, the systems inside your data center, it's everything that touches it uh, and every one that touches it. I find myself just flabbergasted still to this day that I have organizations talking to me that they're still having user error as a primary means to cybersecurity risk. And I don't understand that. And in today's society and everyone's reading it on every television news channel or every article all over the internet, all about cybersecurity breaches and banking breaches and Target breach and Home Depot and you name it. And, and, and I just don't understand how God, you know, I talk to on a regular basis says, yeah, Bob, you know, Sally comes to me and says, I'm sorry, I clicked on this. My computer's infected. <laughs> He's like, why would you click on that still? At this time, you know, but I talk to organizations every day and user training, one of the primary budget items on the list is user training still training users don't click on things don't use bad passwords don't use your dog's name and and you know your address for a password um you know be a little bit more thought provocative behind it you know it's just uh, you know people just want to go about their day and they don't realize that they're putting their organization at risk that you know so your point is has it changed uh, that piece of it still has not it's one of the primary largest risk components inside an organization is the users where it has changed uh, is you know like i said you know the internet of things and machine learnings and a manufacturing plant never used to have to worry about uh, potentially getting hacked through their machine out of the manufacturing floor but that's very real now uh, and and that, and that can very happen the target breach was that it was you know uh, internet of things it was a hvac vendor that had access to the HVAC systems that were reporting back diagnostics for all the target locations. It was a small little, you know, 100 person company that they had managing and maintaining all of their uh, HVAC systems and they had the them internet capable reporting back diagnostics. The hacker hacked the 100 person company and right through to the to HVAC system and then right through into the point of sale systems. So getting they got through that's how they got through was they didn't breach target and go after them and, and hack them they hacked the 100 person hvac company and then got the target and it was all through the hvac system being able to talk back to a computer software system taking uh, diagnostics and making sure that they were operational and uh, making sure the refrigeration units uh, all in the stores, uh, they report back that if they're not working properly or if they have alarms on them for certain temperature control pro uh, issues. I mean, in those refrigeration systems now are massive sensors that send information all the time back via internet. So, you know, those are places now where the, the industry's changed. You have to make sure that those systems that nobody ever thought of before are locked down. You're going to see far more breaches uh, and far more exposure through proliferation of internet of things than you probably ever have before right they're not going to come through the traditional method but i'll tell you every article i read the biggest and and most capable way to get through an organization is still fishing through users you know the, the good old human error right and we wonder why we're going to get replaced with machines is uh the fact that we can't not click that link that says i want a hundred dollar amazon gift card wow i am groaning over here bill groaning so this may or may not be related but have you been following the wikileaks release uh, for uh, the last week a little bit yeah well this week we found out that it was all about the cia and how the cia can masquerade its malware as belonging to foreign intelligence agencies we've found out the cia malware targets iphone android smart tvs uh, computer systems and cars it also targets windows os x linux and routers and um not only that but i guess they lost a lot of like the cyberware programs so now there's a serious proliferation risk i don't know i mean like what are your thoughts on this and do they relate to your risk mitigation in a part of your job well they do and you know to think that the government doesn't employ some of the you know most uh, intelligent security people in in the world is you know a short-sighted uh, venture 
you know, NSA wasn't developed because there's a bunch of dumb people uh, working for them. Uh, they're probably some of the smartest people in the world. But to say that the government don't have safeguards and controls and loses things, well, you know, they lose shipments of guns all the time too. So, and, and well, money, and that's a big container, <laughs> though. I mean, it's a you know, it's off a cargo ship. I mean, how, how do you lose it? As a matter of fact, though, it's funny you mentioned the cargo ship. I was just reading how ports, one of the biggest uh, terrorism threats or threats that we have is that very thing, right? Uh, cargo ships delivering uh, cargo container units, then they only check probably 5 to 10% of them. And there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them going through every port every day. So they're trying to use AI intelligence to track these things, uh, to be able to uh, RFID code them. And when it hits a certain point, just track them automatically with AI intelligence. But uh, so I digress. But I was just reading an article about that the other day, and it really intrigued me, as because I've always been concerned about. Hey, wait a minute! You're, the, you're only checking ten percent of thousands and thousands of containers. Well, you know what's getting through. But you know, so that was just something that, that intrigued me the other day. Is you know, does it affect me? The CIA? Well, yeah. I mean, it affects everybody, and them being so nonchalant about the protection of this and. Is the CIA responsible for developing computer viruses? My answer would be probably yes, right? We want to know what our enemies are doing, and, you know, it's back to the old Cold War days, right? You know, before, we used to use spies. Well, now we're using spies, but we're using computer spies. And those computer spies are called bots and botnets. And uh, we launched them against our enemies, and they launched them against us. And, you know, it's basically, you know, a, a larger version of the Cold War. Right. No longer do you use a human spy, you use a computer spy. Similar thing, though, right? Yeah, it's going to affect everyone because when hackers get their hands on code, uh, it tends to you know, put more things at risk. But to think that the hackers already didn't have uh, the code, I mean, there's a reason why they're always two steps ahead of all the security vendors, right? Is because it's a big business. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. And, uh, you know, they want to make their money and, and go right off into the sunset, you know, much like a bank robber, right? Bank robber wants to get rich, quick scheme, and uh, then he wants to go, you know, live on and buy his own island. Same thing for, you know, uh, trying to uh, short people on the, the stock market or, you know, the mortgage industry. The, guy, the big short was written just on that, right? was, you know, them trying to get rich. Everyone wants to get rich and they want to get rich as fast as possible and not work hard for it. So if there's ever a shortcut, you know, people are going to find it. But yeah, I mean, it puts people at risk. So, I mean, I read articles about how, you know, organizations or, or software and, and uh, computer uh, security companies are using AI. Um, to defeat that. And actually, what's really cool is you're using it in the art of deception, where the hacker thinks that they're getting the data that they want because the security system is telling them that they are. They're kind of leaving the door open. You know, if I leave the door open to this uh, room over here, you're going to look in there before you look in the one that's locked, you know, and I'll let you believe that the stuff you really want in the do room that the door's open and, you know, I'll hide the, the door that's locked right behind the wall. You'll never know it's there, <laughs> right? But I'll leave this door open and I'll leave a few hundred dollars on the table so you can come take that and not go after my millions of dollars and hit in any other room is the art of deception that they're trying to use with, uh, with uh, computer hackers. It's a really interesting time. Um, it's scary, but it's interesting. It's also quite fun because, you know, it's kind of a cloak and dagger kind of a game that they're playing. Yeah, and especially if, you know, the CIA or, you know, probably even now corporate organizations can masquerade its malware, you know, just like what you said, maybe making it look like a house of mirrors, or maybe the CIA is making it look like it's actually, you know, the Russian intelligence agencies it's truly becoming uh, just a global house of mirrors. Yeah, I mean, you know, the idea is if you're, you know, you're busy pointing at someone else and what they did, no one's watching you, right? Well, hey, you did uh, kind of point out and kind of bring up AI and machine learning, and this is probably a good enough time as any to kind of talk about what your predictions are for, you know, we can go just the next five years, we can go the next 10 years, and um, what have you seen so far that's just incredible in terms of AI and machine learning, and what are you thinking and how are you thinking it's going to advance? I never thought I would see the day when a car could drive itself. That in itself is something of amazement. You know, to think that we could take the human error eventually out of car accidents would be 
an amazing feat for our society. Yeah, 30,000 deaths in, in the United States every it, year. Agreed. I mean, I just literally saw a Subaru commercial last night where they did a before and after kind of a look and feel to the commercial where they showed the husband and wife, truck pulls out, car in front of them, hits the truck. They're behind them, and they show before, meaning a husband and wife couple behind them in the little red car slams into the back of the other car, and they show them both side by side in the ambulance, cuts on their faces, and not knowing where they are. And uh, then they show the after, where the car slams on the brakes for them, and they look at each other in the car in amazement that the car stopped, and, but also they flash back to the amazement of them looking at each other when they were both hurt in the ambulance and watching their kids flash behind their eyes, right? And then they show them getting out of the car to help the people that were in an accident in front of them. It was just so compelling of a, a use case for why you want the car to be able to stop for you. It was very compelling. Uh, it was very heart-wrenching. You know, I have two young small children, and, you know, th that makes you think, would I now look at or having uh, the next car I buy have a system of that on it, that it could learn, that it could, could do that uh, for me? You know, by all means, yes, absolutely, I would think that. You know, I look at some of the technologies within, you know, what Audi developed within some of their uh, lane learning uh, technology of the car. A buddy of mine I work with uh, just bought a brand new Audi uh, station wagon car. And uh, he tells me that basically the car could drive itself. He has a program uh, on it for uh, traffic. Living in Chicago, we're familiar with traffic, right? And, you know, the problem is, is, you know, I got to use, I got to foot on the brake, gas, foot on the brake, gas. The Audis develop traffic sensing cruise control system where the cruise control system will sense the cars around you and you leave it on and you never have to put your foot on the gas or brake while you're in bumper to bumper traffic. Amazing. I was floored. So, you know, those things and the advances just to see what they've done the cars. We're just talking about what's out on the market Correct. right now. Correct. I mean, you asked me what amazed me already. And I'm like, I can't, I don't even know where that's going to go. You know, the prediction is, is that because of that car technology, they're eventually going to take the truck driver out of the seat. And we're going to have nationwide uh, shipping with no truck driver to take away the uh, human element of falling asleep at the wheel away. You know, my cousin was affected by that. He got hit by a truck driver who had been driving, you know, back and forth Wisconsin for, you know, like 36 hours straight. And uh, was tired behind the wheel. And he slammed into them at a toll booth on 294. You oh, know, but wow. imagine what the possibility is of taking that human element out of it is. Right now, they'll say, well, you're taking a lot of people's jobs away. Well, do we really need a human being sitting behind the wheel of a truck to drive it from one state to the other? Could that human being be doing something more intelligent with their brain and their thought process and doing something more to help you know, their family and society as a whole? Maybe they can help develop uh, systems for the trucks so that they, you know, because they are a truck driver, maybe they can give them input as to what the what you need uh, to accomplish that goal. Where I see it going is, you know, almost the sky's the limit, almost where with machine learning and, and AI and where it's just at today, you know, where it could go could be, you know, they're predicting the eventual uh, merger of human and machine. We're seeing Terminator, the movie coming alive here. Ray Kurzweil. It, I mean, I just, I don't know that I truly believe in that prediction, but you know, that's, you know, by the age of 20, 29, they're saying that, you know, computers will learn faster than the human. It'll take over the human thought process. They already learn faster than us, but they're eventually going to take over the human thought process, which is the problem solving and the analytics capabilities that the human mind has that you can't build into a machine. They're talking about actually that taking over. Where I would like to see some of the advances of going is, you know, organ replacement and some of the things that, we, you know, we could use machines for and, and have them learn the human body. And uh, if you need a heart or a kidney or something, you actually can use a machine for it rather than, you know, uh, having someone sitting on a donor waiter li waiting list, right? Yeah, I mean, I think there's going to be huge advancements uh, in biotechnology, nanotechnology, and robotics technology. Those are the big three domains of huge advancements that are coming up as a result of, you know, breakthroughs in, in artificial intelligence. And who knows? <laughs> who knows if that merger prediction is going to come true? Uh, that's I think that's a Ray Kurzweil prediction, by the way. He has been uh, right on a lot of other predictions, too. So 
that kind of uh, brings up a lot of a lot of ethical concerns, a lot of you know philosophical concerns. The replacement of humans by technology, though, has been happening since really the dawn of time, but it has been an exponential increase in the last uh, 100 years or so. Well, yes, as society, you know, as we advance in, in just normal life and, and advance in technologies, uh, it's going to be a natural replacement, right? Uh, we used to have people manufacturing and, you know, putting cars together. That's all been replaced by robotics. Robotics can do it better. I have a friend of mine who works at a screw factory where they make screws for automobile, the automobile industry. You wouldn't think there'd be a massive market for that, but there is because there's so many screws inside of a car. But their machine learning is changing the way they do business because of product waste and raw material waste. And the human can't keep up. And, and change the program, the machine fast enough before mass amounts of thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars worth of raw material loss. Uh, the machine can learn on the fly and change its settings on itself if there it's a millimeter off on a screw because that screw won't work in that car if it's got a certain specifications, right? So um, you know if it's just a millimeter or a centimeter off, uh, the machine will learn and change for it to save raw materials. Uh, so, you know, companies are looking at that, that can help boost profits. It'll pay for the machine in no time if I can, you know, save myself on raw material. Do you think about this a lot? And do you and your peers in the cloud, you know, space, do they talk about it a lot? Because it seems to me that your field specifically is kind of, no offense, but propelling th this revolution to go along. We, we do talk about it. We're developing, well, so internally, we're developing tools to help us orchestrate and automate cloud resources. And so therefore, we can have customers, you know, dynamically turn up more cloud resources, right? AWS does it. Uh, you, you just go on their portal and you type in how much you need. And then, you know, 10 minutes later, it's ready. You know, it's all automated. They built in an automation process. So the automation as a whole is pushing a lot of the advancements, right? Is uh, you want automation and, and remove the human element out of it. But you still find small companies that don't have any of that, right? I'm working with a small company that is a software manufacturer, and they want to move to being a software as a service company for one particular reason, predictable revenue. And they want a predictable revenue stream. And when the big mothership of Microsoft moves from licensing that you own to a monthly predictable revenue stream, everyone will follow suit down the line. Microsoft got tired of you waiting seven years to buy more software for them. And, you know, them having to announce that they're going to stop supporting systems for you to actually make a move and change because people don't want to change. I believe change is good, especially in business, right? If you stay status quo, like we talked about earlier, the 20, 30 years of that system being around, uh, that's just too long and uh, you're going to be left behind. So, but yeah, you, I mean, we talk about it. We talk about it in, in the cloud environment. I sit on, you know, a couple different conversational panels uh, where you talk about, you know, automation and orchestration being one of the key advances in, in cloud technology. But you also talk about the software companies and, and startup companies that are all tech driven that are pushing that as well. Right. Um, there's some article I read that there is not a company that was founded after 2008 that owns a computer. They own a laptop, but their applications and systems are sitting out on, a, on somebody else's cloud. Any one of those companies that are developed after 2008, they don't have any of it. And then the app smartphones and app development and everyone coming into the app business is uh, also pushing those advances, I think, because everything has an app now. And you'll see in Chicago alone, where there are companies that are developed just strictly for an app. I mean, for example, I don't want to give them any unpaid publicity, but like Spot Hero, it's an app, but it's a hundred person company in Chicago tech market. But in its primary job is to find you parking in Chicago. You know, it's, it's Spot Hero, right? Uh, whether or not you want a paid street parking spot or you want a parking garage and you want to look at the cheapest one that they've negotiated. And, you know, if I work downtown, I primarily take the train. But if I drive, I use Spot Hero because I don't want to pay $35 for a parking spot. And uh, it, it'll find me a $17 parking spot near my office. So, um, so that's beneficial, right? Another one is Shift Gig. It's basically an app, and it's for restaurants and, and bar workers. And they can go on there, and they can find a shift. 
That's what it's meant for, right? And they have partnered with restaurants and bars to put their shifts into the app that are available for people to pick up shifts. It, it's an amazing tool to have part-time employees who are going to college and doing other things who, hey, you know what? I got a free night. I might as well pick up the shifts so I can make some more money. And how would I have done that before? I would have had to call my boss and, hey, can I pick up a shift? No, it's covered tonight. Well, what if I wanted to pick up a shift at the bar across the street? They don't know me, but now they post their job up on, you know, someone calls in sick and they post their job up on the app and I just go to the app and click that accept and it has my profile all on there. So they know that I'm a qualified bartender, uh, that I'm not some, you know, kid who's never bartended. And, uh, you know, so my profile is all acceptable and they say, okay, accept. Amazing. But that's another 100, 200 person company. So I, I follow something called Built in Chicago. It's it's called the Top Tech Companies. I'm on their email chain. And uh, it's an amazing what you see in these tech companies that are coming up with these ideas. Uh, who would have thought of, uh, of an app like that? Uh, where, you know, you could publish shifts out there. Now, I didn't. Otherwise, you know, I'd probably be in the Bahamas somewhere. But the next million dollar idea, I'm, I'm looking for it, but I have yet to come up with one. But it, amazingly, so I, you know, as much to back into your question again, I do think cloud companies, but I also think apps and uh, the, you know, everyone being app centric in the world now are, are driving these changes and driving these advancements because everyone wants to, you know, all companies want to create an app. Every company is trying to create some sort of app if you look at uh, the, the society, right? Yeah. Bill, I, I got three more questions and then we can wrap up. We could do a quick one here. Virtual reality and the advancements in VR, um, how do they relate and what are your thoughts on it? I don't know that it relates to my job in cloud. I, well, I mean, I guess if I peel back the onion a little bit and think about it, I suppose whoever's making the virtual reality apps needs computer space in order for them to hold those apps and let them serve the mass public, right? And, and they're putting them on cloud environments. We do have a lot of gaming companies that are in the cloud space because they don't want to own all those computers and they want to just focus on their gaming. And, you know, they can trade one game for another game in a, in a matter of days and use the same computer space. So, you know, it's just a matter of writing some code. So, you know, I do think virtual reality, it's amazing, right? I tried one of those VRs uh, with the Samsung on it. Have you ever tried one of those? I tried the Oculus Rift, the latest version, at a hackathon, and it would blew my mind. Uh, I, man. I, I literally thought I was going to fall off the mountain. I was like, you got to take this thing off? Freaking me out. <laughs> but it, so, I mean, those advances in, in virtual reality, you know, are, they're there. I don't, I don't know if you're ever going to get into, um, yeah, I believe they, you know, they made a movie about it. I can't recall what the name of the movie was, but yeah, the well, I know the Matrix. That's different, right? There was, I think it was Tom Cruise was in that VR movie, right? Where you lived in a virtual reality world. You didn't know if you were in the real life or not. The Edge of Tomorrow. Yeah, but then, and then there was another one where uh, you could pay for your ultimate experience. If it was real or not, you were getting shot at or whatever. I forget. Anyway, I digress. I don't want to waste your time with that. But anyway, so I do think, you know, virtual reality is, another up and coming that's here i guess uh, i just i don't know where it fits into the mainstream uh with you know people you know utilizing it for fun i, I guess uh, i would suppose maybe my kids might get into it i'm not sure uh, i guess it could become you maybe you're in the video game now which would be kind of cool you know if i could you know be uh the guy in assassin's creed i, I suppose that would be really cool uh, it might scare me, though. That would be cool. <laughs> a lot of jumping, a lot of jumping around. <laughs> it might get tiring. It might get but, tiring. But it's a good way to uh, exercise, okay, man, I suppose, I, I, right? I, you know, it, it takes you out of the mundane on the treadmill, uh, puts you into the video game, and you'll never uh, know you're, you're exercising. Bill, if you get VR plus an omnidirectional treadmill, I think you'd be set for life. Hey, there's my million-dollar idea. Right. Hold on. <laughs> anyway. There it is. There it is. Well, hey, I, I do want to interject like one existential kind of philosophical question in each episode. And um, we haven't really talked about it, but, you know, briefly touching on how robotics and widespread automation is going to be replacing and reducing a lot of the human labor force. And what do you think? Because humans, man, they they really connect their job to how they define meaning in life. And without jobs and without without that part of their life, 
they might lack some meaning in their existence. So what do you think about that? I stopped because, uh, you know, I'm 45 years old and I'm from a different time, but I've adapted my thoughts. I've adapted my position in life. I've adapted my skill sets to be in the new world. You know, I started out, like I said, going to DeVry, studying binary code, but when I was going to DeVry, I worked in construction. So I'm not afraid of uh, using a hammer and a nail and, you know, all the tools necessary to build a house. But at the same time, society, you know, in life, uh, it shifts and it changes. And I've been open-minded about that. I, I don't know where... And I, and I believe that society as a whole will become more open-minded about that because what you're going to have is an aging population that would be against something of that, meaning, you know, I worked in a factory, I want to work in, you know, I had a good job. But the days of having a 20, 30-year job and a, and a pension, uh, they've long been gone. And so the new workers of today, they don't have exposure to that. So they're trying to find their own path and their path is to individual wealth and creating some sort of of uh, nest egg themselves that they can lean on later in life. So, you know, I think embracing that with the idea of, you know, I, I don't want to be status quo of holding down a $50,000 a year job and for 20 years and then just retiring. Uh, I want to go make a million dollars and, you know, I want to think outside the box and, and be an entrepreneur. And that's, I think we're pushing people to be more entrepreneurial then rather than go and punch a, a time clock you know, work in the, the salt mine, so to speak. You know, I, I think that philosophically, people are going to be hard to embrace that. But I think that the people that would be harder to embrace that are already moving out of the workforce. You know, the younger workforce will be more adamant to embrace such a thing because they didn't come up in a time when that was the case. You know, if you still want to do a human related job, I guess, you know, go be a bartender. Uh, it's very easy to do, um, you know, and, and then you can have the hum all the human experience and human interaction you want. Uh, but, you know, I think that, you know, human nature as it's itself is ever changing. And if our minds can think of all the incredible advances and things that we've made so far in this technological advancements in society, I think our minds can also embrace the idea that the average what we used to consider the human job will be replaced by robots, but it gives me the human the ability to use my mind now rather than my brawn and figure out a way to earn a living uh, doing something that maybe I'm far more passionate about or I'm far more, you know, I love more. You know, before it was just you worked in a factory because your dad worked in a factory and your, your uncle worked in a factory and, you know, that went down generations and generations and and you never thought of anything else. And, and did you love it? No, you really didn't love it. You can't tell me you did. <laughs> so I think now it gives you the ability to say, well, that's not there for me. Uh, now what is? And uh, with tech schools and and the like being so readily available now, you can, you know, go learn something else fairly inexpensively and a different skill. And it only take a couple of years. You know, you don't have to you know, attend a, a, a four year uh, Ivy League college uh, if your finances or your situation don't promote that. You know, I do think that while some people do have a problem with that, I ultimately believe that the new people coming into the workforce will embrace it more so than than others. Bill, I, I think that was beautiful. <laughs> I wasn't expecting. I didn't think uh, you were that much of an optimist either. So that's good to hear, man, from you. My last question is, what's your advice for people, whether they're young or they're trying to change careers? And what is your advice for those people that want to get into IT and specifically the uh, cloud space that, that you're into? Well, I would, I mean, if it's something you're passionate about, then, then I would say, you know, what you need to know is that it's going to grow exponentially and it's a incredible industry to be in, but at the same time, it's going to bottom out at some point. It's going to hit the, you know, the ceiling. The next best thing is, you know, if you're entering the workforce and something you want to be thinking about or entering the cloud spaces and industry or changing industries, you might want to think about that next step. And the way I think about it, or at least what I've been putting into it is, what are my customers looking for from me? 
and and how do I help them versus, hey, I'm, I'm in the cloud business because, but that's just not the value I bring, right? I bring value to my clients and I consult with them on them trying to change their business and ultimately transform their business, whether that be helping a software company become a software as a service company for predictable revenue, but it's more so to help them grow and help them see the possibilities down the road. If you're passionate about that and you want to come into this industry, think about it from the perspective of what the advancements in cloud computing and the overall technology industry, the impact to the everyday company and how you can be impactful in your messaging and your your position with in particular the, those clients, right? Th that's what I would say. I mean, you know, I, I see companies using it for many different reasons today, not just the norm of, hey, I want to put my my SQL application uh, in the cloud. They want to, you know, be more thought provocative. Now, now that I got it and uh, I moved it into the cloud, now what? what? What's next now? Because I did that for a reason. And here, my reason was X, Y, or Z. I wanted to go into a new market segment. I wanted to change, shift my business from, you know, one type of business to another, whether that be, you know, I, I manufacture widgets, but now I want to manufacture keyboards or Whatever that might be as your particular business, you need to find that out about your client and help them uh, get there because there's an underlying goal and there's an underlying objective. And if you do that, you'll really add value, I believe, right? Great. Yeah. That's a great answer, Bill. Thank you. And um, that's pretty much all the time we have. But for every guest, I like to put them on a lonely island and I like to give them only a few items to give them. So for you, I wanna give you one book and one book only to bring onto the Lonely Island. Yeah, you know, I saw that you had uh, that on your other, I knew that I was gonna be like, cause the only books I read, uh, I'll be honest, right? I don't read uh, books like for fun or, you know, not to say for fun, they're fun to me, but they're books on my craft and, and what I do and, and trying to be, you know, more of a, a perfectionist. I would have to say that there's no wrong answer. Yeah, if it were for fun, you know, I guess I would, uh, you know, I don't know, Pete Rose's book. That's probably the only book in the last, you know, five years that I've read that w w was something other than technology. I'll tell you, uh, storytelling is probably the one that I've been most intrigued with now. That's a beautiful book on selling and, and talking to customers and talking to uh, people in life, utilizing stories. So you'll hear a lot of what I did today or a lot of my conversation with you today. I tried to back in and tell a story. Uh, around a particular case that I'm, I'm faced with with a particular client or something I've seen in the past and I relate that to a story. Storytelling is something that uh, intrigues me. I find myself very good at it. That intrigues me. So I would say this selling via storytelling or storytelling on parenting is another one I'm reading. Is definitely something that is uh, intrigues me that I would want. Cool. And um, your Lonely Island pick for a musical record. Musical record. An album, an artist, whatever you prefer. The one, the only one, though, that, that you could bring that you'll always be listening to on the island. I would have to say Stolen Temple Pilots. Nice. <laughs> Excellent. All right. And then uh, your Lonely Island pick for a website. If you could put a website in the back of your pocket, which which website? Only one website that you could bring. Oh, Caribbean Life. <laughs> Excellent. All right. And uh, one app that, that you'd bring. Wow. The one app I can't live without seems to be Amazon. Well, hey, listen, Bill, you have been uh, a very excellent guest. You're just a wealth of knowledge in your field. And uh, it was a great time talking to you, man. And I can't wait to have you on until next time. I appreciate right? it, Jake. You have a great day. It's been really fun, something that's been exciting to me. I had never done anything like this before, and, and I would look to do more of it. As I had said, you know, when we were going to do this, uh, that, you know, I, I wanted to get this mic because I want to do video uh, vlogs, right, uh, and, and presentations. And so I'm going to utilize the tools and, you know, making me feel a little bit more comfortable with it today uh, to go and take those skills uh, somewhere else. So I appreciate that. And thank you for giving me uh, uh, that kind of skill. You know, so you, I've gotten something out of it in return. So thank you. Bill, I wish you the best of luck, man. And I think everyone that listens to this is going to be like 
damn, that guy knows a lot. <laughs> I hope that they at least listen to it, enjoy it, not just say, you know, what a hack. All right, Bill. Take, take care, care. Bye, Jake. All right, that was Bill Walwyn. You could reach out to Bill at linkedin.com slash I-N slash Bill Walwyn. W-A-L-L-W-I-N. I told you that guy's a powerhouse of information and just a wealth of knowledge and experience. If you are in the market for corporate housing and short-term rentals, why not choose Corporate Suites Network? Corporate Suites Network is Chicago's premier source for all things month-to-month apartments and furnished apartments and short-term rentals and corporate housing and they're just amazing guys they're just so amazing csnhousing.com they've been in the business for decades they have a professional dedicated staff waiting to just listen to you and talk to you and convince you that you know what maybe corporate housing and short-term rentals is the thing that you need to do and have and be in right now so csnhousing.com Until next time, everyone, take care. Bye.